Well, hello, everyone. Good evening. Well, it's evening here in London. I don't know where you are. Um, and very, very warm welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us for this uh, very special event. My name is Casper Melville. I, I teach at SOAS. I teach creative industries uh, at SOAS. And um, this is the first in a series of five sessions where, where it's a course, really, that we've developed over five sessions, which will all be on Thursdays at this time uh, for the next uh, five weeks, including this week, um, called Curating Art and Culture in a Digital Age. And we're looking at all aspects of uh, the, the relationship between art and culture and the, the digital world. Um, uh, let me just give you an idea of what's coming up beyond this session. So we've got, um, we've got uh, sessions on music and technology featuring uh, the audio artist Vicky Clark and Kaya Malami and Andrew Dubber, who runs Music Tech Fest. Uh, we've got a session on digital filmmaking with Professor Lindy Way Dovey, who's going to be talking to us about her incredible African Screen Worlds project and introducing us to her team there. We've got a session on gaming, the art of gaming, uh, which will feature uh, the curator Marie Fulston and uh, Tim Flusk and Kieran Reed from uh, the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa. And we've got a session on the art market featuring uh, Victor Wong, uh, Calvin Hui and um, Yan Kang uh, talking about the impact of digital on the art market, on museums. So we've got an incredible series of sessions and I'm really glad you can join us. Um, you should, uh, now you've been registered, you you'll get notifications about all those sessions. But today we're going to focus on social media. So we're thinking about the curation of art and, cult and, and uh, culture in the age of social media. Um, I will be introducing you to my panel in just uh, a moment, but let me just um, tell you a few things. The first thing is this, this course is a collaboration at, uh, between uh, two kind of different units at SOAS, the Centre for Creative Industries, Media and Screen Studies, which I co-chair with Professor Lindy Way Dovey, and the Postgraduate Diploma in Asian Arts, which is um, run by my colleague, uh, Malcolm McNeil. So let me just kind of set the scene a little bit. What we're really interested is, obviously, you know, we all know what digital is. We, all, we are all, you know, imbricated in a digital world. There was a big offer and a promise of digital, and that promise was about democratization. It was about the idea that digital would allow, you know, artists and audience to come closer together, to have direct kinds of contact, to, to uh, you know, sidestep the gatekeepers, to change the, the way that, um, you know, the sort of systems, the old fashioned systems in, by which we had been, um, you know, organized through what they call legacy media. And so we want to kind of test some of those arguments. Is that, has that been the case? How do artists and audiences use uh, digital media, and in this session particularly social media, uh, is it been has it been a boon for artists? You know, what does it mean for artists' incomes? What does it mean for art practice? What does it mean for cultural uh, for cultural practice? Is there a way in which social inequalities are somehow reproduced in the digital space, or are they in fact are there ways in which we can get around them? Can can we imagine the digital as offering spaces of resistance or alternative ways of thinking about the world through art and through culture? So those are some kind of the key questions we want to look at and think about. And obviously we've all been in a lockdown COVID situation for the last you know, year and a half. And so we've, we've just like this session, we've all been pushed online and it becomes an even more pertinent question uh, than it had been before. So I want to introduce you to my amazing panel. I'm so excited to, to uh, introduce them to you. So if, if panelists could turn their cameras on, first of all, we've got Amy Dawson, who is the deputy digital editor of the art newspaper, the kind of, the, the, the paper of record for the art world. Um, Amy's just broken her foot, I think, today, or was it yesterday? So uh, thank you so much for being able to still be here. I hope you're sitting down and sitting comfortably. Um, then we have Rania Matar. Rania is a Lebanese-American photographer, artist. Um, her work has been exhibited all over the world. I mean, I couldn't read out the whole list of places where her work, but let me just give you an idea. The Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, Carnegie Museum of Art, uh, Lundbrook Museum in Germany, Sharjah Art Museum, National Portrait Gallery in London. You can see her work in all these places. And she was a Guggenheim Fellow in 2018. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Rana. Fantastic, Rania, excuse me, fantastic to see you. And then our third guest is Francesca Sobanda. She's a lecturer in digital media at Cardiff University, and she's the author of the book, The Digital Lives of Black Women in Britain. She's written widely and published very widely on issues around digital culture, a remix culture, race and identity and gender online, uh, social media, CGI influencers, woke washing, a, a very wide range of, of fascinating topics, which I hope we'll be touching on in this discussion. So I thought the best, best way to start this is perhaps to kind of 
interrogate our own social media usage. So I just wanted to start by asking you, um, you know, and I'll start with you, Amy, I think. I mean, do you use social media? How do you use social media? What what do you use? So um, unsurprisingly, I'm a bit of a social media addict as I guess millennials, we sort of started this whole trend. <laughs> um, but yeah, so my main platform of choice is Instagram. Um, I use it for work and for personal use. Um, and then I guess I use Facebook because I had it when I was, I don't know, 14. And uh, I use it to keep in touch with family. And I hate Twitter, but I want to love it um, because all the journalists are on it. And um, I want to get involved with TikTok, but I, I, th I feel like I'm actually too old at this point. I don't know. Oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> but you're aware of it. It's, I, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's it's there on my shoulder all the time. Um, and that raises an interesting question, actually, because we're trying we're talking about social media in this session. But actually, the, 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 you know, there's social media. There are platforms, but actually they kind of merge, don't they? In some ways, TikTok is kind of both. Um, well, I mean, yeah. And, you know, a lot of them, they have so many similarities. Instagram, and Facebook are, you know, Instagram is owned by Facebook. They, they're slowly becoming, you know, intertwined. TikTok brings something out. And then Instagram brings out reels to compete with it. So they're all very much, you know, part of a an, e an ecosystem and a, and a competing kind of industry. So, Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Francesca, how about you? Are you a social media user as well as someone who writes about social media? Yeah, I've got a pretty fraught relationship with social media, actually. Um, so I use Twitter. That's pretty much the, the only platform that I, I use actively in any way. And I think... I mean, I get joy from it in terms of connecting, communicating with friends and learning about things that are happening that that aren't covered in mainstream media and just generally, I guess, curating a timeline or, or curating um, content that I want to see as opposed to being confronted with with images or news stories that feel harmful and traumatic. Um, and that's not to say that that doesn't happen on Twitter as well, because it absolutely does. But I think I sort of go through different stages and phases in terms of how I feel about social media and maybe about seven eight years ago I really was kind of off everything for a period of time um, and I think yeah during the pandemic you're reflecting different things and I'm really torn because like Amy said I'm definitely somebody who is you know online quite a lot and it's not that I feel it would be easy for me to necessarily step away from some of the platforms that I use but I am thinking about you know over this next year or so and um, how do I want to maybe do some things differently and yeah, what would it mean to, to step away from Twitter? Well, that's a fascinating question. And maybe we can talk about that in terms of, you know, when we think about the pluses and minuses of the social media space and think about actually how can you use it ethically and perhaps what's good for your mental health, even in terms of, you know, interaction. Rania, um, I think you and I are perhaps of a slightly different generation than our, our other guests. Um, yes, uh, <laughs> you know, we, when we were teenagers, there was no social media. Uh, are you a social media user? How, what do you use? How do you use it? Um, I originally, I have to say, I have uh, four kids uh, and I got social media really originally to keep an eye on them. And I feel like now I just, I use it more than they do. It's kind of scary, actually. Uh, I mainly use Instagram. Um, I mean, I'm a photographer and it started really as kind of just something to post my daily life and keep in touch with people. And somehow as Instagram has become a little more... Um, widespread in the art world I feel like the personal is kind of disappearing a little bit from it and it's becoming more about my photography and I have to say that I have a love-hate relationship with it I mean it's been as I'm going to talk lately uh, um, in a little bit I it's been very good to me on many levels but it's creating I mean it stresses me out and I just tried something after we spoke last week with Amy to turn off all the numbers like of so I don't see um, how many people liked anything and nobody could see how many and I, I want to try it out I just did it last night and I don't know if that will help a little bit just make it more fun again and not focusing on numbers in any way. Well, that's a fascinating point and we'll pick that up because we will have to explain what what that conversation was and, and I mean maybe Amy you can you can help us with this I mean give us a kind of um, general sense of the way in which the art world has been affected by kind of digital and social media. I mean, you're the deputy digital editor at the art newspaper. I mean, how long has the art newspaper had a digital editor and been tracking these things? Is it something that's changed? Has it become more central to the practice? 
Yeah, so um, the art newspaper was founded in 1990. It was actually, it was born about two months before I was. And um, it obviously was print. It was actually a big black and white broadsheet. Um, the website kind of came along, at, you know, early 2000s. And um, def- but there's always been a focus on print. Um, you know, it's a monthly newspaper. Um, and, you know, the website was kind of a supplement. And slowly over time, that has obviously, the, the balance has, has completely swung in the other direction. Um, so, I mean, we've had web editors, um, you know, as long as we've had the website, uh, but they also worked on the print. And obviously, they're very closely connected. We publish the same stories, but at different times. Um, and obviously, we publish more on the web. So I am probably the only person that's focused entirely on digital. Um, and that's kind of happened in the last two, three years. Um, and it just kind of grew from the fact that, you know, I start, I actually started at the Art Newspaper as an intern six years ago. And slowly as I kind of, I mean, I think my main qualification was just being the youngest person on the team. That often um, is the case, isn't it? You do, <laughs> you do the social media stuff while we get exactly. on with the important print things. But exactly. Change. You fiddle around with that Facebook thing and uh, see what happens. Um, talk to the kids. Um, no, Make but something it, go viral. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, and I very much learned on the job in terms of, you know, using social media in a, in a commercial way. And I think that a lot of, you know, companies, um, artists, publishers, people in the industry would say the exact same thing. Um, we're not big, we're not big conglomerate businesses um, in the most part. You know, obviously there are some blue chip galleries that are um, and some big auction houses. But in general, you know, it's a lot of small, either individual businesses um or you know small teams that make up these companies so um yeah I think it's been uh, for everyone in the industry a learning curve and I I really think that um Twitter is has always been very popular with kind of academics and um journalists um and you know it's a great way to find news and and that's still the case today but I really do think that Instagram is is the um the app the social media platform that really captured the art world's imagination and um you know i think now it would be hard to imagine an art world without it and i write my i I have a monthly column at the art newspaper called insta gratification where i write about the intricate ways in which the instagram and the art world are intertwined in the good the bad the ugly um and yeah it's just becoming more and more we're going to get some we're going to look at rania's work and and Look, focus in on that so just give us a sense of some of the stories I mean I was kind of browsing your recent stories um, and there seem to be things like people selling art, art auctions moving online uh, uh, you know into into social media space museums um, dating using art in dating app. just tell us a bit about some of those most recent stories that you've covered I mean it's actually fascinating to see um, how the innovative ways in which you know the art world is using um, Instagram and uh, in ways that I think Instagram never anticipated. And that's why it's constantly updating, bringing in all these new features. Um, But I mean, one of my favorites is the uh, art world goes dating. Um, There's a meme account. I love memes, um, just basically satirizing the art world, which is much needed um, in a business that takes itself too seriously. And this anonymous freeze account it's called freeze magazine um it which mocks actual freeze magazine um it's uh yeah they basically asked people to send in their details from the people in the art world and it paired people for date for, for dates basically sent them uh direct messages dms and um yeah so try and cut it's basically like networking a lot of what happens on instagram is networking yeah. um making contacts getting to know artists um and but there's a lot of sales and i think that's definitely something that's increasing more um one that kind of really nice initiative um is the artist support pledge which started during the pandemic um by someone called matthew burrows who um basically you put this hashtag in a piece of work you should put up a piece of work that you want to sell can't be more than 200 pounds um you put this hashtag artist support pledge and um for every thousand pounds that you make in sales, you'd put an, you put 200 pounds into buying another work. 
by another artist. So it's cyclic. That kind of pay it forward type. Exactly. Of yeah. Yeah. So it was important at a time when you know people were really worried about you know the industry collapsing, artists kind of, you know not being able to survive and things like that. But as well commercially, you know, auction houses are starting to use buy it now functions. I was looking at Bonhams today. You can literally click on the picture and it'll take you through to the directly through to the auction sale. You know, so there's lots of different interesting, very creative and and also kind of more a bit like luxury goods way of selling um, that's happening on there. But it's fascinating just to see what keeps popping up. And I've always got things to write. <laughs> Just before we go to Rana, Rania, just tell me, she referred to this idea of turning off likes. And I think it was something that came out of a conversation that you had. So just tell me what, what that's something to do with kind of some of the negative aspects of social media, which are being addressed. Tell, tell us about that. Yeah, it's one of the things that um, it's, it's something that Instagram um, and Facebook have been rolling out over the past few years, testing it in different territories and stuff. It's based on um, the idea that there's been a lot of um, kind of negative mental side effects, um, particularly in, in young people, um, based on kind of, you know, the number of likes you get and kind of placing a lot of self-worth value on that. Um, and so they've, um, they've been trialing turning off likes so you can't see the number. Um, so you can see, you know, if you have friends that have liked it, it'll come up and say Rania Mata liked this picture, but it won't tell me necessarily how many other people liked it. So you don't know if it's three or 703 or 3 million. Um, and the idea is that, you know, it it stops peer pressure. It stops you from following a crowd. It's then it's for both sides. It's for the, for the people who are following. But again, like people like Rania who want to just kind of, enjoy the you know don't don't want to say oh this work is better because it got more likes or this don't one must be rubbish crowd. yeah yeah uh, I mean you know if we can if we can test this I mean if you follow the kind of whenever I open Netflix and it tells you you know this is the most popular and the idea that that would be the best is easily contradicted if you ever click on it <laughs> so <laughs> there's some idea Rania please um, just before we I know you're going to show us some work which I'm really keen about but just tell us so you turned off likes on your on your Instagram which presumably is a lot of your own work there so why, why did you do that I literally did it last night because I thought you know what we're talking about Instagram I wish I did it earlier so I could talk more about it today but I thought of something along the line of well, lines of what Amy's doing I mean a lot of the, I, I, I work mainly with, I photograph. I like to photograph. My work has been about younger women, the ages of my daughters as they're growing up. And I post some of my work and it's helped me find people to photograph, which I would talk about. But I realized I also post some of the images and I didn't want the, the woman in the image to assume that her picture is not good because I don't get enough likes either. So, I mean, or if I got, to, if this would, let's put it this way, if this picture got more likes than others, I, I've started worrying about the women that I'm posting. Competition, yeah. Uh, because, you know, again, people like things for different reasons at what time it appeared on their screen or whatever it is. And I didn't want the women I photographed to judge their own self-worth according to the image that it, the likes have got on my screen. So I'm going to try that. I don't know. It's, it's, it's so fascinating to me the way in which, because this technology was all developed before people even knew how they were going to use it, and we've all yeah. had to make it up as we go along, there is no kind of ethical framework. We have to we have to kind of figure it out as we go, including what the consequences. And, and the reason the, the work I do is really to empower these young women. So the last thing I want is for any for Instagram to have the counter effect on them, you yeah. know? Uh, so I, I literally did this last night before I went to bed and I have not spent time on Instagram well, today. I, so you'll have I'm, to come back and tell us how it's worked. Yeah. You're going to show us some of your marvellous work. So please do, please do share your screen and, and, and talk us through some of the ways in which your work and social media have interacted. Before I, before we get to that, let me just, let's just get clarity because I remember asking you when we met before, are you a kind of, are you a digital photographer? And I think you told me that you'd only, you bought your first digital camera like this year or last year. Just describe uh, your your practice. You're kind of analog. You're an analog photographer, really, aren't you? I'm an analog photographer. I'm a purist about this, and I resisted uh, getting. I love my film camera. I I work with a medium format film, so it's a large size negative. And but I have to say, I did start scanning my negatives. So I was not quite a purist in the sense that I was working on them digitally, even though I was I shot them 
on film. I love the skin tones and I love everything, the texture of the film and everything about it. And my process, I love the fact that in this kind of fast moving pace, I mean, everything is fast moving. The fact that I'm shooting film and I have to wait for the negatives to come back, then I made contact sheets, it slowed my whole process and I love that. Now during COVID, I started this project that I'll talk about briefly about photographing people through the windows. And there were, then there was an immediacy to that project and nobody was developing film. Yeah. So I went ahead and bought a digital camera and I hate to say that I'm liking it. So <laughs> I might <laughs> okay. be moving into the new, <laughs> the new century finally. Wonderful. Well, do, please do show us, show us some of your work, Rania. And um, well, I can't wait to see it. So do share your screen. Um, okay, I'm gonna share quickly, mainly in the context of my relationship to social media. Yep. So I, again, as I was talking, I photograph mainly women. I photograph in the United States where I live, in Lebanon, where I'm from, and in Palestinian refugee camps. So for me, it's about sharing that universality and the beauty and the shared humanity. So I post some of my images online. And, um, and mainly, it's also, I mean, I don't post everything. So I don't want the women I photograph to think that if I didn't post their pictures, it wasn't successful enough, because I don't want to reveal all my work either. But I try to reveal enough. And uh, so and I feel like it's a necessary evil right now with Instagram, it keeps you. Um, um, I mean, it's, it's important to stay relevant, I think. So, but I also, I, I'm showing a couple of those images, because one time I got this message into my um, DM box, the, the, the message that you don't really see, it goes if somebody you don't follow. I got a message from this woman that she would love me to photograph her. And so I went to her Instagram page and she had this on her story, don't follow me, I'm toxic, which I thought was the coolest thing in the world. So I said, yes, I would love to photograph you next time I go to Lebanon. And I have photographed her uh, a few times over the past two years, I want to say, and she's been a fantastic person to collaborate with. Um, sorry, yeah, this is the last one of her. So I have to say, this is somebody I would not have found if it wasn't through Instagram. And she reached out to me. So, and it's been a beautiful collaboration we created. And for me, it even shattered my own stereotypes about the fact that she's not, I don't care if she's veiled or fully covered, but the fact is that she is really willing to jump in water despite the full thing. And so that I want to, I went to Instagram in a way. And then I photographed this woman and I realized Instagram helps me stay in touch with the, these young women. So I'm also using it because this is their generation as well. So like I had an exhibition in Washington. She was from Wichita, Kansas. She flew to see her to, to show. And I love that there was this thing that I could reach to them and stay in touch with them by via social media. Uh, the reason I'm showing this is when COVID happened at first, I mean, it forced us all to slow down. And even though if, and it's important for me to look at the physicality of the prints to, for, because on social media, people they think they see your work if they just scroll like this in about two seconds on your page. But seeing to edit the work, it was important for me to make all these prints. And when the lockdown happened, it helps me spread all the work in my studio and forced me to slow down. And I realized how many images I had uh, having to do with the sense of the windows, which I hadn't quite consciously been aware of. Maybe because we're stuck inside, the whole thing took an extra, another level, another meaning. So I use Instagram again by putting this post on Instagram from a picture that I had done before, that if you live about 30 minutes from where I live, I would love to come to your window and photograph you. Uh, and I got an unbelievable response to that. So in the next year, in the last year, in the next few months, at that point, we thought it was temporary. So I was getting all these messages from people to that they would love to be part of it, part of it. So I realized there was such a beauty to Instagram, especially during the lockdown that kept us connected to each other. And for me, this project could not have happened if it wasn't, if it weren't for, for that. And I really photographed like over I mean, I don't know, maybe over 150 people. Uh, some of them I kept visiting over the years. And then the Boston Globe caught it, which is the main magazine in Boston, again from Instagram, and they wrote about it. Um, so I'm showing a couple of those because this was new to me and it was a little bit overwhelming to have these come because of 
social media, really, right? Um, and then I was supposed to have an exhibition of a previous project of mine and a museum in Florida, the Cornell Fine Arts Museum. And then they saw this work and they decided to offer me a show of this work as well. And this is how I ended up meeting Amy, who's here today, who, who she introduced me to you guys. So that's why I'm on the panel again. So it went full circle. So Amy- Your Instagram buddies. Your Instagram buddies. <laughs> So she wrote about that work in the art newspaper. So uh, this is kind of to show a little bit the positives of it. And I'll talk afterwards about the negatives. And one day during uh, the protest in the U.S. after George, the George Floyd murders, and there was such divisiveness in the country, I posted that image. And I got this message on, message on Instagram that evening. Um, which you are in French, basically, I would love to buy this picture and offer it to the ICA, the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston. So this picture ended up in a museum and it happened because I posted it on social media, which was not the effect I had. If we have a couple of minutes, I could share one more thing that I used uh, the platform oh. for. Am I okay with time? Yes, yes. Um, so the, on, on August 4, there were the two, exp uh, the, the port explosions in Beirut that were horrifying and being, I'm, I'm from Lebanon originally, being outside of Lebanon was horrible and I felt helpless of what I could do. So I offered uh, the picture on the left originally in an edition of 30 and I offered it for sale where 100% of the, the money would be donated to uh, SEAL, Socioeconomic Aid for Lebanon, based out of New York City. And it sold out within five hours. And I wasn't selling them cheap. I was selling, selling them for $1,000 each to speak to the humanity and the way, the connectiveness that's so important that people were there for each other. And that was very humbling and touching for me. The same as during the Windows project, it's like the need to focus on the positivity and stay connected, that for me came the same. So I offered the, pro the picture on the right and this sold out within five days as well. So that was one way to use Instagram. The other way I use it is I teach uh, workshops with since the, um, as you touched on it, as for your course right now, I used to teach my classes at the university and now it's happening online, but I started teaching in more areas than in the Boston area. And I would post it on Instagram and it, the, the workshops would sell out within a day after I post them. So there was something pretty incredible about this. But I also started posting before, like if I'm, before I go to Lebanon, um, you know, I would, I'm going to Lebanon, I would love to, to collaborate. And I would find a lot of women that I ended up photographing and meeting because of, uh, because of that. Uh, so this is just, I have my Instagram, uh, my web designer ended up adding my Instagram uh, kind of page or whatever you call it on to my, that you could add, see on my website and it updates. And the last thing I would say is now I'm working on a book of this work and I'm sure I'm gonna be using Instagram too. <laughs> yeah, and it's all being done digitally at one remove, isn't it? But that being said, I just wanna add something um, that, I do find Instagram stressful as well. I feel like it is forcing me often to post images when I'm not ready. It's uh, as we were talking last time, it's like feeding the beast. And, uh, and I feel like it's sometimes it's nice to take the time to edit the work before putting it out there, but I feel there's this pressure to. There is a kind of different, a different time, time frame, isn't there? Thank, that was yes. fan, fan, uh, fascinating, but also such beautiful, beautiful images, Rania. Thank you so much for sharing those. Francesca, your work, um, it, you know, you take, it's not that you're completely negative about social media, but you're very uh, alert to uh, critique. And um, one of the, you've, you've written about black women's experience, digital experience, and you've kind of shown that some of these, um, you know, the social divisions and inequality which exist in our world are reproduced online in various ways, or, um, and certainly certain, the way in which kind of blackness has been constructed online has been, has been uh, you know, something that's worthy of critique. Can you talk to us a bit about that? I know that you, you particularly worked on this, I, I was reading some of your work about CGI influencers, which I just found fascinating. It's not something I ever really considered, but can you tell us a bit about that as well? Um, yeah, sure. And um, so I think there's sort of three elements to this that I was thinking of speaking about, and I'll I'll share this single slide that I've got, which relates to the rise of CGI, computer generated imagery or virtual influencers. So I think even though they are fairly recent in, in terms of them being you know a, a thing and um, when you look into sort of oh 
I think that's disappeared. When you look into how things have changed since around about um, 2018 or so, it, what becomes clear is that even though CGI influencers or virtual influencers are always picked up in various conversations to do with the media, to do with celebrity, to do with digital culture and the creative and cultural industries, they've actually been around for longer than is sometimes apparent. So some of the work that I've done has involved looking at how the development of these CGI influencers who are often really racialized as black and um, looking at what the development of these influencers suggests in terms of the relationship between blackness and um, commodification, colonialism, and the different ways we've seen the experiences of black people, especially black women, and aesthetics associated with blackness. Can we really... just be clear, sorry to interrupt, but just be clear, these are not actual people. Yeah, these aren't people. Um, so, so on this slide, these are virtual CGI influencers. And when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking about why why they exist, first of all, and um, why so many of them seem to be racialized as black. And also when you look at the content that is posted alongside these influencers, not only the visuals, but the captions that are used, the hashtags, it's clear that they're often functioning in ways that involve pushing messages to do with so-called diversity. So Lauren Michelle Jackson has written really brilliant work on this and looking at the different ways that specifically images of black women, for example, are created in relation to a white gaze as part of this process of creating CGI or virtual influencers. There have been a lot of changes since I've started to look at this, but it seems to be quite an expanding area. And there's this, I think it's something like the world's first digital only model agency. So the CGI influencers who featured on that slide, I think all of them are associated with that agency. And last time I looked, I think there were six or four um, CGI influencers that were a part of that. And since I started to do research in this area, the website has become you know, particularly polished. There's more content there. And I think because there is an awareness of the critiques that exist, we are seeing different ways in which the creators or those involved in the development of these CGI influencers, I think are trying to come across as being more inclusive of people from different backgrounds. So even if the creators of a black CGI influencer aren't black themselves, I'm noticing that I think they're they're attempting to at least come across as though they are supporting um, you know, black creatives and um, um, black artists in, in different ways. So, you know, the cynic in me would say that's that's just a reputational management strategy as opposed to anything else and there's still a really clear disconnect between these influencers and how they look and who they're meant to resemble and why and then the people who are creating them. And are you suggesting that they were responding themselves to criticism that they had received on social media? Is it a kind of self-critical space in that I way? I mean I can't help but feel that way. Like I said there, there are some really good you know critiques, really brilliant pieces to do with exactly this and I do feel as though there's enough out there for those involved in this work to not be able to do the, this work without some degree of an awareness, particularly the criticism that addresses the creation of influencers who are meant to resemble black women or the creation of influencers that most definitely involve this connection to blackness. Yeah. So actually with one of the influencers I showed there and an article I've written surrounding this, I think the critiques we've seen in response to him are very similar to critiques of the work of Maplethorpe in terms of the fetishization of black men black body, and, yeah. and yeah, the spectacularization of, of blackness. And something else I was just thinking about whilst we were, um, you know, speaking about all of our different experiences was a research interview that I did over this last week. So some of the work that I do really focuses on the experiences of black people in terms of working as artists, creatives, and also the experiences of different people of color. And I had a conversation with somebody about the expectation they felt increasingly that they are not only an artist or a creative, but they are also an influencer. And of, of course the boundaries can be blurred, but I think that, what is difficult is there are certainly people who don't want to be viewed as an influencer in some sort of way or to be more explicit people who don't want to have to be posting consistently and, and don't want to have to make themselves visible online in some of the ways that the industry is perhaps demanding of them so one person I spoke to said you know it's not that they don't appreciate the work that their peers are doing or the different ways that other people are using social media and digital technology to share and create work and um, they said it just when it came to to their own experience they were really reluctant to do that and they spoke about feeling as though there was this pressure to be consistent and constant 
And that actually quality was sometimes compromised as a result of that. Or this idea that the, the only way um, somebody's work could be legitimized would be through, through numbers and would be through visibility that is connected to these, you know, capitalist oriented digital platforms. So I think, you know, what I'm hearing from our different conversations is the, there's this real tension between the opportunities to, to share work, to connect with other people and um, to collaborate as well, to participate in forms of community, but then also so this real emphasis on productivity and commodifying processes that are sometimes at odds with the values of artists and creatives. And when I'm thinking about all this, I'm also reflecting on how algorithms function, whose work tends to be made visible, who actually is most likely to benefit from these platforms in the first place. And certainly when we look at racism, when we look at intersecting inequalities, and especially when we're dealing with anti-Blackness, some of the opportunities that might be available to artists who aren't black um, are, are not going to be available to, to black artists and black creatives who are perhaps trying to share their work or get it out there in the same sort of way. So maybe to sort of close, close what I'm talking about here, I think it's, it's really helpful to sit with the messiness of all of this. And um, certainly with the work that I do, I'm not dismissing the opportunities that are, are there to make use of digital technology and social media, especially when thinking about transnational forms of solidarity and thinking about collectives that exist across continents. But I also am always mindful of who has access to, to digital technology in the first place, who's most likely to be censored and um, who gets to share their work on their own terms, who doesn't, and who's most likely to also profit from that work or, or to receive credit for it too. Well, one of the things that we know is that to, to your last point about who's going to profit is that no matter what kind of alternative communitarian, you know, even radical type of collectivities might be happening, it's all being organized by and the data associated with this being profited from by very large corporations who are now so large, they're bigger than countries. And that is very leads to a big I mean, how do how do we square that? Um, I mean, do I mean, maybe it's impossible to square it. But how do you how do you think about that? It's hard because I suppose it's that whole thing, we don't exist outside of capitalism. And I think the last thing we need is for, for there to be any implication that, you know, individuals can sort of solve this situation and, you know, due to their personal choices. These are structural issues. But I, I guess it's maybe a question that I would throw back to, to, to industry and, and, and those who have power. And it's thinking about how is the industry changing in ways that's actually increasing these sorts of demands, this emphasis on fast turnaround, 24 hour, and um, this emphasis on digital engagement. And I think, you know, the points that were made earlier are really brilliant in terms of thinking about engagement beyond numbers, beyond visibility, beyond follower counts. And yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky. The solutions, I don't think, you know, can lie at the level of individuals, but at the same time, I don't think it's going to be a top-down process either. So I guess it's, I think there are moments of disruption, there are moments of, of jamming where people are both engaging with, with these platforms and technology, but are also doing it in ways that involve pushing against um, the, 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 the commodifying elements of what's going on. That's and, an interesting way of putting yeah. it, the idea, the idea of jamming. I suppose it's the idea of hacking originally, mm. which is being, or remixing. Amy, can I ask you about influencers? I mean, I'm, I just can't imagine who the people are who are following and allowing themselves to be influenced by a, a CGI creation. But in the art world, are there art influences? I mean, my, my very limited understanding of these things, for example, in fashion, a lot of my students write about fashion influences. And it seems that fashion influencers have acquired a status within fashion, uh, which is the kind of status that previously uh, journalists had or you know, you know, important kind of non-digital figures. Is that the case within the art world as well? Are there key, is there such a thing as an art influencer? It's actually kind of fascinating because it, it's something that hasn't really emerged very strongly in the art world. Um, I guess that's because, you know, art, it's very hard to own multiples. So like if you can't send someone a Picasso and then they're like, I really recommend this product. You should all get one. Um, oh, good so, point. Because of this, the kind of oratic nature of the singular object, it, it works against. Exactly. Yeah. Principle. But there are definitely, you know, big social media art world personalities um, who, you know, it's more about what they say. Um, you know, if they really rate a show, that show will go on to be huge. And if they really trash it, it'll be binned to art history. So they're operating like art critics. Yeah, there's definitely like, there's definitely a lot of like social media made critics um, that wouldn't necessarily be given the kind of airtime in journalism. 
Um, but, you know, they, they have a following often because people on social media just love it when people are really outspoken. That's one of the things that I think is a, is a strength and a weakness of, of the platforms. Um, you, you get really honest opinions. Um, people feel somehow more comfortable to, to, you know, really unleash. And that can be that can create some really interesting creative conversations or it can create a lot of angry hazing um trolling uh nastiness so um yeah i think it's not it's not the same kind of influences but for sure there are you know you yeah, follow and i i mean maybe to get to get onto the kind of um issues around how we actually use it and how one uses it i mean rania you're in a position now to be you know, you're using social media as a kind of PR, as a way to reach out to communities who, I mean, in some ways, it's fulfilling the promise to democratise the art world, because in the old days, it would have been you in a gallery, and only the people who were coming into the gallery. Now, now your gallery is available and free to everyone. But then what kind of relationship do you have with your followers? And does it, is it in danger of tr taking more from you than you want to give? in some ways? I mean, how do you manage your kind of relationship with that? I don't know how to manage it, but I feel like now, for example, I'm getting a book published, right? And people don't buy photo books the way they used to buy photo books because a lot of the the material is available for free online now. So that uh, I had an ex I was I had an exhibition once and I exhibited work for the first time and I was so proud of it. And somebody came, oh, I know this picture. I've seen that. And I'm like, Oh my God, they saw it on Instagram. So it's, um, I think it's a demon we have to deal with a little bit and I'm not sure what the answer is. So I feel like um, I have to use it. It's been good to me, but I, re I see the downside of it uh, in many, many ways as well. Uh, so I, I honestly, I don't know the answer as much, but we were talking, as Francesca was saying, I photographed on this, another note a little bit. I photographed this Palestinian refugee since she was four years old. I mean, her only, uh, she lived, she was born and raised in a refugee camp. Her only con connection to the outside world is social media. And during the latest events in Gaza and in Israel, and I'm not getting political, I'm just talking about social media here, because she followed the group on Facebook of Save Sheikh Jarrah, she got, um, her, her account was deleted from Facebook. And and that I find unfortunate. I mean, so, I'm not, so I, I honestly, I see the two sides of it. And I, I guess I'm trying to navigate it in a way that could help me and my art and my work without it being too detrimental. But it becomes pressure. I mean, I feel like if I haven't posted in three days, I have to come up with something to say. And, and I don't necessarily have something to say on that day, right? <laughs> that doesn't stop a lot of people from posting, right? it seems to me. Yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you, Francesca, about this. I mean, you work in digital media. I mean, you teach about digital media. There is an impression where, where that, you know, this really matters and it's important. But one of the effects of it is, and of course, during lockdown, this was inevitable, is that we spend all our time on a screen and that we, you know, victim to a certain, just a certain way of interacting. I mean, how do you, how do you feel about that? I mean, do you ever feel like telling your students, you know, turn it all off <laughs> and go outside? So I think, I guess my starting point with this is just re remembering during lockdown and um, that there's so many people who, who aren't spending most of their time and um, looking at screens. There's so many people specifically who, you know, didn't get to work from home and so many people whose lives, as, as much as they were changed and impacted in different ways, the, the ability to, to be in a, a particular personal space was not available to them. So I think it's it's difficult because I guess with all of these things, it's, it's thinking about the context and thinking about the case-by-case -case basis situation. And I recognise that Sometimes engaging with this stuff, it's some people might refer to it as a necessary evil. I know the conversation I had with the person I was mentioning earlier on, he said, even though he's not actively online as much as he feels he should be, um, he, he makes use of, of social media to a certain extent because it feels necessary for him as a creator and as a creative. But I am the first to also, you know, as, as part of the teaching that I'm, I'm doing, and first to, I guess, also encourage people to think about the fact that the online is always connected to the so-called offline. And I think sometimes there's a risk that we speak about these things as though the, 
exist in isolation. So many of the issues people encounter online aren't going to disappear by logging off or, or closing a laptop. They're still there and they can be amplified in various ways in digital spaces. But the problems we see online, for me, they're, they're not a result of the technology itself. The, the way they look and the shape they take is, is impacted by the technology, but they connect to histories of oppression um, and that, that you know, aren't going to be addressed overnight and definitely aren't going to be solved as a result of tech. And the last thing I was going to say in all of this is I also think there are really interesting disconnections or connections between the different ways that terms such as, um, you know, artist, creative, influencer, how they're understood or used in various spaces. So this person I was speaking to actually said when he thought about it, many of the well-known artists in his field, um, he would say definitely are influencers, but he'd say they're influencers first and foremost because of their influence in the field, that their influence associated with their work. But that influence is now sort of enabled by social media and digital technology. And for him, it was less about whether or not that person identified as an, as an influencer. It was looking at how are they responded to within the industry? Are yeah. they regarded as established? Yeah, like a Kanye West or someone like that, maybe. Um, Amy, let, let's just sort of bring this all back around to art, to, you know, the art world a little bit. I mean, I'm the, the, the kind of art I'm most familiar with is music. And there is a kind of narrative, which is that there's something that, about the, the way we consume digitally, which is damaging to our experience. You know, um, people have short attention spans. They click through things. They don't contemplate, you know, don't spend time contemplating. They don't give themselves enough. You know, is, is, is there a worry about that in relation to, you know, uh, social media and the relationship with the art world? Yeah, I, I definitely think, you know, you ask anyone, um, obviously it was great to be connected on social media during lockdown, but there wasn't a single person who wasn't desperate to see art in real life. Um, and I mean, it's the way that I always try to think about it. And um, Francesca, you know, touched on it. You know, the two things should be seen as complementary to each other, not subsuming one another. So, you know, Instagram is not you know, scrolling through an artist's Instagram page is not in any way going to replace going to see their work in a gallery. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, it's a, just a different experience. And a lot of the things that um, I'm writing about with Instagram is it's not just, you know, we associate it with just scrolling um, through feed images, but there's so many different things now. Like I wrote today about an art fair that's using those, you know, those face filter type things that you that you use on Instagram. Um, you scan a QR code and comes up as an Instagram filter and you are seeing digital artworks kind of interacting with the environment around you. Like sort of Pokemon. Yeah, is it like a Pokemon Go for the art world? <laughs> um, but there's, yeah, so Kadaf art fair, um, which is online, but they're, they're doing like a digital art month with these codes all throughout Paris. Um, yes, yeah, so you get the most incredible images and, and they are, you know, very different ways of looking at art. It's not like being in a museum, but it's very interesting. And that's the thing, um, you know, these technologies are allowing us to, to experience art in a different way and also encouraging artists to, to try different things. And you're getting more, you know, of a crossover between the digital and like the digital field, like techie coding people and um, and the art world, as we've seen with the much, oh, much beloved NFTs, NFTs <laughs> yeah. um, um, which I hate. Um, I'll just put it out there now. But um, it, it's it's interesting, and and you know it's causing disruption. It's it is making the industry change and adapt, and and that's always a good thing in my eyes. Um, so. Yeah, I think that there's just lots of different ways of experiencing art. And I don't think that social media replaces the traditional ways, but no, it's good Rania, to have you were, you were talking about this, Rania, and I just want to sort of probe it a little bit as a working artist. So you're, you've got your photograph that you've taken, which has taken you time to make and think about and frame. And then you put it on social media and then people see it and they sort of scroll past it very quickly. And then... I think the way you described it was they might see it on the wall of your exhibition and say, oh, I've seen that already. I mean, have they experienced it? Have they seen it? Is it the same thing? Is one just a, you know, one is just a kind of symbol of the other or does it have its own status? Well, I don't think it replaces this at all. I mean, I print my stuff really large. So when you see it, you go in it and you could, and there's a, there's a physicality and, 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 uh, 
and it's an object it's an art object i mean on insta i feel like on instagram everybody becomes a photographer really right but at the same time as amy was saying like the i think the lockdown made us a little more creative and i think that's here to stay like a lot of the galleries had what's called the viewing room or they started to like my show at the museum the picture i saw i saw i showed at first the opening was supposed to happen in january and then it shut down because they had a wave of uh of an up, up, uprise in COVID. Yeah. And they had this gorgeous uh, way of seeing it um, that they did this whole installation, like a three dimensional scan of it to see the art. And I think th there's a lot of positive that came here to stay. I mean, these are beautiful to have the capability of doing that. Um, I found that I thought I would hate teaching online because I love to have the students actually make prints and experience making beautiful prints. This, you don't see that on Instagram mm. or on social media or even digitally, the quality of the beautiful paper and the, again, the physicality of it. But I have to say there was something positive about teaching online is I got students from Kuwait to Mexico um, just now. We would not be able to do that. So I think, again, I'm going back to what both Francesca and Amy said, this kind of combining two things now are probably here to stay and i hope we make the best of it on some level yeah i mean i think what, what's so interesting to listen to all of you talk about your your practice and your your critique is you know there's a there's a deep ambivalence to these processes and there's a kind of uh, things are changing so rapidly aren't they i mean we wouldn't have been having this conversation two years ago um and and you know nfts is the latest thing and is it going to be the big thing or of not you know a bust and you know the things move very quickly and then we have to try and integrate them into our lives and not kind of allow them to take over our lives and there is very much an addictive quality potentially I'm, i myself fall victim every now and then to a kind of you know that dopamine buzz of the retweet and then i have to remind myself you know it actually doesn't really matter and it's not a validation they don't really know you although they might laugh you know ha hard at one of your jokes or whatever so um, it reminds me, you know, there is some thinking, there's a, there's a French theorist called Bernard Stiegler who talks about the digital space being a pharmacon, he calls it, which is an idea he takes from Plato about something which is a kind of both a poison, but potentially a cure as well. So it obviously has a, you know, there's a, there's a potential positive benefit. And it kind of almost suggests that we all need to be quite alert to the kind of things that Francesca is talking about in terms of the infrastructure and the the way in which social inequalities kind of reproduce within the system sort of sometimes hidden away big data and whatever but also in our in in our daily practice just like you rania literally yesterday deciding maybe i can do without likes you know experimenting with the the infrastructure to think about how it could be used you know better more fruitfully in a less damaging way i wanted to ask you something rania because you kind of mentioned it a little bit which is there is an argument about the the ubiquity of digital technologies and 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 the way that it puts the tools into people's hands which is that what we see this so andrew Keane famously uh wrote this book called the cult of the amateur where he sort of says you know art is dead music's dead because everyone can do this everyone can be a photographer we've all carrying around the camera in our pocket it's devalued the professional nature of being an artist do you is that an anxiety that you have rania is that something that you I don't have an anxiety about it. I think it's, it, I think many people assume they're photographers because they have a good iPhone and they could go take pictures and post them. Uh, I don't overthink it. I mean, I keep doing what I'm doing because I'm passionate about it and I'm doing it the best way I can. And maybe in some level, this is why I resisting going to digital in the first place uh, and to stick to film. Uh, but um, so I, I don't know, I think eventually but I feel like with everything, right, it goes to extremes and then somehow things settle somewhere in the middle, um, maybe. Um, be nice. I mean, I, what I care about, and this is what I always tell my students, is to really work on the printing of images, because this is where I worry about more, is about losing that sense of... Yes, of photography, of making beautiful prints and, and, and framing them and seeing them as an object, because again, you, you don't see, you go to a museum and you, or a gallery or you, whatever, even if it's online, you see a gallery, it's very different than looking like this at work where you're not spending the amount of time, you're not going into the space. So, but yeah. yeah. It's, it's funny how it relates to kind of, you know, memory as well, because I realized that I, if I look at what photographs I have in my house of my, me and my family and my children and whatnot, 
I've, it goes up to a certain point and then disappears. And then I realize, well, I've had all of those photos on my phone and they stay on my phone and then they sort of disappear because I run out of space on my phone. So whole chunks of my kind of visual memory, which I have grown up with, don't <laughs> exist. Sorry, I'm, I'm guilty of that with my children, I have to say. <laughs> I'm printing my work. I'm taking all the care with my work. I mean, you see, I mean, I have prints in my studio here. Uh, even when I make prints, like you see in the back there, these are prints that I made and they weren't good enough to go to a show. I still have a hard time throwing them away. Um, so eventually they will. In the meantime, they clutter. But uh, there's something so beautiful about seeing the objects as art. Unfortunately, with my kids' photographs, they are on my phone. And there's something I like about it because before a certain point, I can never find the images because they're not on my phone. <laughs> That's so interesting. Like this relationship when we talk about the object, material culture, when it becomes clutter, you know, <laughs> it's almost like dirt, you know, dirt isn't actually a really thing. It's a something which is in the wrong place or, you know. I was at a, at a talk once by a curator who said that the younger generation doesn't like to buy art anymore because they don't like to own things. So I find that interesting in the sense that um, they're used to having everything in here. So they don't want to own the actual stuff. So I think it goes beyond that. And that's worrisome. And they said that, you know, the art market is changing because the collectors are mainly the older generation. I don't know if you feel any of that, Amy. So this is just the side. I mean, I just bought a one bed flat and I can tell you that I do not have the whole not wanting to own thing. <laughs> problem I yeah, the have the opposite problem <laughs> um and I don't know if that's a generation thing or I, I don't think so I think very much for me um you know I'm, I'm in a very aesthetic industry um owning beautiful things I'm a bit like a magpie so I have a lot you know whether it be clothes or art or all kinds of things furniture you know I I like to curate my own space and I think that a lot of people who you know are that way inclined to do the same thing. Um, but obviously there, there is a move towards owning things that aren't physical. Like, again, I can't, I can't believe it's me that keeps bringing up NFTs. You and your like, NFTs I know, uh, <laughs> honestly, I'm pushing the agenda. No, I'm really not. Um, the number of pictures about NFTs that I have to set fire to every day. <laughs> um, but no, there definitely is, you know, um, there is a, a traditional idea about ownership, which is about physical objects. And that definitely is changing um, with new generations. Um, but again, I wouldn't say it's generational. I think there are some people who are technologically inclined more than others in all areas. Um, I just want to warn the panel as well. I haven't forgotten the question about where you go, you know, who's got good social curation game? <laughs> you know, where do you, I mean, if the answer is nowhere, you know, I only look at my own Instagram feed, then so be it. But what we're looking for is, you know, recommendations or just places that you find yourself returning to that you think does a good job of these kind of things. I think um, it's fascinating that you, we use the word curating like that. There's, yeah. there's such a long time it's been a curator was kind of like a very lofty Superstar. position. Yeah. yeah. And now it's like, oh, curate your own Instagram page. At the art newspaper, we're banned from using that verb um you have you to say really? yeah you have to say the curator organized a show or whatever you can't, can't actually say, use it as a verb we don't use the verb to curate no why not <laughs> because we don't see it it's used so wrongly by so many people you, mean you, don't, you, you, you don't use it like that outside of the context of no we just don't use it at all at all, at all. curators like a... organize things that's and truly we hilarious. don't use the word to curate <laughs> because it's so abused now. And, you know, you get people like, you know, Adidas curating a shop or something. And you're like, no. Beautifully curated menu. There was a, a case with BuzzFeed last year with the Black Lives Matter um, protest. Lots of photographers um, put pictures up on Instagram and Twitter and BuzzFeed embedded them. Um and they got sued and had to take them down because it was seen as, you know, they, they weren't paying the photographers effectively. Um, and they were kind of using this embedding feature to sidestep that. Um, it's, it's still very much a gray area. And, you know, it, as these cases are brought into courts, that's where the rules are being made and that's where the precedent is being set. But as we talked about before, these legal and ethical guidelines have not been created. Um, you look at Instagram's 
guidelines and they're all very much like you know everyone please be friends don't put up any naked pictures yeah if you could just like remember this is a safe space um some of of it seems as futile as listening to governments talking about getting jeff bezos to pay his taxes well who's gonna what are you gonna do you know who who's powerful enough to, to to stop this on that question francesco it seems to me it related back to something we touched on earlier about the kind of the way in which you know, no matter some of the negatives we talked about, there is something about the digital space which provides room for critique and a place to circulate alternative, you know, views, including, I mean, I've learned, you know, during, you know, from Black Lives Matter and Me Too, I mean, the, the circulation of information and the, the rallying, w- w- there was genuine politics happening there, wasn't there? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I think also I was just going to pick up on some of what was been discussed before and um, because I was just thinking about power dynamics surrounding sort of terms and and sort of gatekeeping as well and I, I was thinking you know there are lots of different interesting perspectives for example to do with this term curator and, and who gets to decide what is or isn't curation and I'm just conscious that you know historically and um, you know curators have often within the art world been white been middle class been upper class and I think with the the digital comes in here is is pushing against that notion of actually what does constitute curatorial expertise, what does constitute the ability um, to, to, you know, creatively put together things in these various ways. So I just thought that was a really interesting thing to first to, to collectively reflect on is how the digital can push against some of the, the ways in which different forms of expertise, different terms, different understandings of what constitutes even art or creativity, political art, and how we see conversations that happen online really challenge the idea of who is the authority figure in the field. The way that I'm considering issues to do with um, class, colonialism, capitalism and commodification in the work that I am doing, um, one of the things I tried to think through a bit in this article to do with CGI influencers was one of those influencers, there was a real emphasis not only on, I guess, this idea that she might represent a black woman, but specifically there is this real commodification of a perception of Africanness. So whether it was earrings in the shape of um, the continent, whether it was the terms that were used, and what I, tr- I tried to think through as part of that work was reflecting on racial capitalism and how that has been discussed and thinking about the fact that with these influencers, it doesn't feel as though it's just the commodification of blackness occurring. There is this real attempt to, or not an attempt, it, it reflects this ongoing um, form of colonialism and, and the different ways that we have seen, you know, whether it's Europe, whether it's, it's the US, um, you know, dif- different nations trying to extractively and very violently essentially um, you know, use um, the the resources and attempt to commodify the people of these different places. And I do think we can't we can't assume that everybody has access to these different forms of digital technology in the same way. And certainly I'm very conscious of how issues to do with class and colonialism and anti-blackness um, collide when we're dealing with what is valued, who is valuing that, and, and when something um, is is seen as being... I don't know, at the centre of the art world, often because it's it's suddenly praised in relation to a white Western imperialist gaze. In my book on the digital lives of black women in Britain, especially when working on the final chapter during the pandemic, again, I was just really wanting to emphasise the point that not everybody has access to digital technology in the ways that we sometimes speak about. And not everybody has access to the internet. And I think I can't stress enough these issues to do with censorship, you know, whose art and and whose views, whose political opinions are, are most likely to result in them being censored, abused online, and also facing very real forms of offline violence and um, that connect to their digital visibility. Thank you for that. And it strikes me, I mean, we can see some really concrete examples of the assumption of access. For example, governments rapidly shifting so that you can't apply for universal credit or other forms of you know, social welfare unless you do it digitally, uh, you know, and hitting the very populations who don't necessarily have access to a, you know, an Apple laptop or a the broadband or any any of those kind of infrastructures. Um, we've talked a lot about Instagram, and I don't know if there was a frustration amongst someone saying, you know, it's meant to be out social media, and you've only talked about Instagram. We, you mentioned TikTok very briefly, saying you don't really do it, and you know, possibly because you know, and this puts me in a difficult position. You're too old, <laughs> you know. For, but what are some of the other, you know, think? I mean, there's Twitch and there's TikTok and there's, I mean. Are, are are they emerging as new spaces for this kind of thing? Do you think? I mean, is are you having to write about this kind of stuff? 
I mean, they kind of come and go. Um, you, TikTok is definitely here to stay. And, you know, some places in the art world have really um, embraced it. Um, in particular, um, in France, they actually um, signed some kind of governmental partnership with TikTok uh, to um, to promote uh, French institutions um, and therefore French museums are huge on TikTok. You look at the Palace of Versailles, um, obviously, I mean, the Louvre is always going to be a big, um, uh, have lots of followers, but lots of really small institutions um, in Paris are, are very popular on TikTok. And, you know, they've been given support to learn how to do that <laughs> which is always the problem when these new platforms emerge they hire young people <laughs> than you to do it. exactly yeah i'm being slowly done out of a job um but so tiktok is really interesting um but it, it's kind of it's the the way that the platform works is um you know it's very fast paced it's kind of meant to be a bit funny it does particularly well with dance and music because of that um also comedians um it's it's got like a very light-hearted kind of quality and, and it's not very good at like getting across like quite hard-hitting stuff or news and things like that which is the, one of the main reasons why i've avoided it if you have a great big collection full of great stuff the Uffizi gallery which is one of my favorite examples of um of museum in the art world that came to social media so late in the start of the pandemic they were not even on facebook which started 20 years ago or whatever um they started a facebook account and now they've got you know thousands and thousands of followers but they took up tiktok really early and they do ridiculous things where like you know the old master paintings like singing along to like billy eilish songs um and they've obviously got a really exciting team um probably very young working on it um and it is bringing them new audiences they say you know they've increased the number of their of young people physically going to the gallery because of their TikTok presence, which I think is a really fascinating thing. And that's a huge issue, isn't it, within the art, the museum world and gallery world, is like anxieties about audiences. How can we get younger people? How can we get more access? I mean, are they, you know, if you go into a museum, is it obvious that they are digitally enabled? Are they, is this coming into the actual space of the museum? Are there kind of QR codes and interfaces and yeah, that I kind mean of stuff? There's definitely, you know, more of it emerging, but I would say in general, no, museums are not very good at, um, you know, having that kind of digital infrastructure. And it's actually, um, you, there's, a, there's a small group of like very specific kind of museum digital tech kind of people um, who have like quite a close knit community and talk about these issues. I get lots of newsletters that I'm subscribed to about very specific issues like this, but one of the problems is, you know, it's very underfunded. And um, this is actually one of the things that was fascinating when we went into lockdown and the, with the pandemic is, you know, we suddenly realised how behind the times the art world was in terms of digital infrastructure. You know, just even um, the websites for a lot of museums are just substandard. Then the idea of trying to do a virtual tour or like an online viewing room, um, VR headsets, you know, was so far away from the mainstream reality of what we had, like the, the foundations. Um, so I think, you know, lots of places are having to do a catch up very quickly. And while you're seeing a lot of jobs going at museums, unfortunately, because of budget cuts and, you know, COVID financial crises, the jobs that are growing, and it's the same at the art newspaper, interestingly, um, are the digital, the jobs. digital jobs. Are you yeah. listening, students? Yes, the digital. Them. Yeah. Either become, a, either become a sort of social media person or a copyright lawyer, I, you know, <laughs> if you really want. And speaking of which, Rani, I mean, this is something we haven't really touched on, but I'm interested in your view on this. I mean, there's a copyright issue, isn't there? If you put, if you put your I images out into the internet, how do you feel about them propagating? Do you try and... Is that an anxiety to you? Do you just let them float free or how do you manage that? You know, it's it's actually, it's another thing where people had let go a little bit. I mean, um, you know, I have this thing on my website that says this is the copyright and anybody who uses the images would be prosecuted. And then now finally my web designer found a way that you cannot just click on it and save the image, but anybody could take a screenshot of anything. So once you put your work online, I think that's, again, another thing that you just have to, 
to assume that it could be shareable. There's such low resolution that um, people cannot do much with them. Uh, whatever you see online, you cannot make prints. And on, I find that on social media, when people share, they tend to say via or whatever or repost. So at least it's coming, it's being acknowledged. Yeah. Uh, what I worry more is, you know, I mainly photograph women and girls. So I'm, I, what I worry more is about them ending in the wrong places. And uh, so I try to, to keep track of that. I haven't had a problem, but um, I think this is the problem not only on social media, ever since people started having websites, is you're putting your work online now. Mm -hmm. But if you don't do it, I mean, it feels like you have to have the work online. Otherwise, um, this is the question that Philip had. I mean, there's a question also via that you need to reach people. Otherwise, you exist in your little bubble and the art is there to be seen, right? So, so I feel like this is something that... Um, Again, it's, there's a middle ground, but even museums, as, as uh, Amy was saying, I mean, now when they have art in the collection, everything is online with what year it was bought, what is the provenance. So things are becoming more transparent in a way because of that, right? And more accessible. Um, like I, I teach a portrait workshop and uh, I have to admit, I want to show my students tons of portraits and uh and i'm so i do take screenshots of people's website to be used only for that slideshow to my student in the context of what this photographer did so i am guilty of that but i feel like i'm using it for the right reason and i don't share that link but you know this is a little bit the day the times we live in Amy, let's let's just finish with you um, and Mike's question because he's he's basically saying that he thinks AR is entering, you know, virtual exhibition. Let's say, have you been to a virtual exhibition? Is it something? Is it going to catch? I've on? been to so many virtual exhibitions um, with, with like big goggles like that. I actually got an Oculus Rift headset uh, the other day um, because an artist has a virtual reality. So. That's virtual reality, not augmented reality. Okay. Um, so virtual reality is kind of like where you are experiencing a world or you feel like you're experiencing a world um, that's been completely created. And that's where you get the headsets. Augmented reality is it's where you have a device that, you know, is showing you something digital that's reacting with your environment. So it feels yeah. like um, the two are meeting, basically. Yeah. Um, and I love augmented reality. And I think the funny thing is, like Rania said, what is AR? You've probably used it so many times and don't even know, like, that's what it is. Every time you do one of those stupid cat face filter things. Oh, the lot of floppy ears. Yeah, that okay. is augmented reality. That was a name for it, sorry. Yeah, so that's the thing. And, and that's the... Um, I think it's being used more and more. It's being used um, really interestingly by artists, you know, just as free filters on Snapchat, Instagram, um, various different things like that. Um, but it's also being used now for sales. I wrote a piece about um, how I think Sotheby's um, were selling this million pound tiara and they had someone create had a company create a filter where you could try it on and they encouraged you to put and you know it was in that they did a background that was like in a you know very gorgeous palace. like palace exactly um but it was very well done and um it's interesting to see you know these big companies um putting um lots of money behind the are they a kind of PR gimmick in some respects but also you know it's pushing the medium forward and I think you'll see a lot more AR and this art fair for example it's a small art fair CADAF but I think you'll see Art Basel Freeze doing a lot more of this kind of digital programming mm. so that you know it's not just you can experience it if you're not at the fair there's going to be a lot more hybrid things happening and things like AR VR Okay. are just going to get bigger i want to thank you so much it's been such a fascinating conversation um and i want to encourage the audience that we've had you should be following these people on instagram and on Twitter. All other social media platforms uh, there are available <laughs> yeah but you, two are, you are the instagrammers and francesca and myself are on twitter you should buy francesca's book digital lives of black women in britain uh, you should buy the art uh, newspaper or go and visit it online. You get some free access, although I had to register We have student it. subscriptions as student well. Student subscriptions. DM me. D ah, there you go. There's the <laughs> offer. And of course, Rani has got a book coming out and we all love books. So we'll keep you posted about that. 
follow her on Instagram. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks so much to my panelists. Um, you were wonderful. It was great to meet you. I hope we meet again and we talk more about these things. Really, really fascinating. So thanks so much and have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.